three of my children are involved in sports at different levels, uh, different seasons. And uh, one of the things that I've noticed about myself as a parent, whenever my children are playing sports, whether it's on the field or on the court, whatever they're playing, well, I've noticed this about myself. I tend to have my focus on my kids. There's a lot of things happening on the field. There's a lot of moving parts happening on the court, a lot of things going on. But I just noticed uh, that I tend to focus on them because they, they matter the most to me. So if you were to say to me, hey, did you see that kid in there picking his nose? I, I'd probably say, I wish I'd have seen that. That sounds really funny. Uh, but no, I was watching you know, my kid. This. Hopefully it's not my kid over there picking their nose. That's probably pretty normal. I think, I think most parents or even grandparents, if you go to a, a game with your child or your grandchild, you're probably going to kind of focus in. Most of you, you don't, you don't have an awareness. You have an awareness of the other things that are happening on the field. Uh, but most of your attention is on, on those children because they matter the most. This afternoon, uh, we are going to have a baptism. We're really excited about that. We're excited about baptism. Obviously, for the life of those who are getting baptized, that's a big step of obedience. And we're really excited for them. We're also just excited because of uh, what that means for the life of our church. When you have baptism, it's evidence that, uh, that, uh, that you're doing what we're called to do. That we as a church really are moving towards accomplishing our mission in helping people live Jesus-centered lives. It's not just a banner that we stick on the wall. We're living that out. And so we're really excited about baptism this afternoon. And I hope you'll come. I hope you'll come and participate in that and support those who are getting baptized. Now, I, I want to invite you to join me in Matthew 28. Because in Matthew 28, it's the, it's the passage that we typically go to when we are talking about baptism. Matthew 28. Get your notes ready. Whether you're using the notes page you got when you came in or on your phone or your tablet, I want you to take some notes this morning. And we're going to start in Matthew chapter 28. And it makes sense why we go to this passage when we are talking about baptism because there's, uh, there's a really great and important verse about baptism here. Let's look at it. In Matthew 28, verse 19, it says, Therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So it makes sense that we would go to this particular passage. There's other ones, but this one makes a lot of sense that we can spend time here when we're talking about baptism. But here's what I think happens sometimes. I think sometimes, just like I do with my kids, when I go to watch them uh, play a sporting event, because they matter so much to me, I, I spend most of my time focusing in on them. I think sometimes we do that with this, with this passage. There's other things happening around that verse that are really, really important. Now, it makes sense that we focus on baptism because that matters to us. It's important to us. But there are some other important things happening around that verse that we need to pay attention to. If you go back to verse 16, verse 16 sets the stage for when this took place and, and where it took place and who was involved. It says in verse 16, the eleven disciples left for, Gal left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. And they saw Him, worshipped Him. This is interesting. Some of them, it says, some of them doubted. Some of them doubted. We don't typically read that verse when we're talking about this passage, right? We go to the Great Commission passage about discipleship, or we, we focus in on the baptism. We, we don't typically look at this verse or right before that that said, when they saw Jesus, they worshipped Him, but some of them doubt about that. These are guys that saw Jesus die. They spent three years with Him, training in ministry, and being taught uh, about the Father and gospel, and he dies, and he's, he's buried, and then the resurrection, right? And, and they, they see him afterwards, right? Thomas uh, touched the, the, the wounds, his hands and his side. They ate with him. They, they were in the upper room hiding, and Jesus appears, right? They're on the beach that one day. For weeks, there are these appearances, there are these, these uh, experiences they had with Jesus. And now, on the mountain, 
he's standing literally in front of them. And yet it says here, yes, they worship, but there's some of them that doubt. It. There's some of them that even though he's, he's right there, they're struggling to believe. How about you? <coughs> Do you believe that Jesus really rose from the dead? Do you really believe that? I think most of us, right? Maybe not all, but there's probably the majority of us in the room that would say, well, yes, of course, that's why I'm here. Absolutely believe that Jesus rose from the dead. I don't understand why these guys were struggling. To which my follow-up question would be this. You say, yes, I absolutely believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Okay, do you share your faith? Do you share that belief with other people? Or do you, do, uh, do you view that as a private matter? Not long after this event, Jesus uh, gives them this last command and ascends into heaven. Not long after this event, in the book of Acts, uh, we have this day what we call the day of Pentecost. And on that particular day, uh, the disciples received the Holy Spirit. And everything changed for them. They were no longer men who were filled with doubt. They were no longer men who were filled with fear. In fact, what we see as the book of Acts rolls out, we see these men could not stop talking about who Jesus is and what Jesus had done in their lives. They could not stop talking about the gospel. And, and it meant for them prison. It meant torture. It meant exile. It meant death. None of that mattered. These guys could not stop talking about their faith in Jesus Christ. It was the focus of their lives. It wasn't just something that they did for fun on the weekend. This was the focus of their lives. It's what really mattered to them. Make disciples, baptize disciples, teach disciples. This was the focus of their lives. go back to this passage, verse 18, Jesus says, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth, therefore go, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and, sh and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, is the only point, you just read it with me, is the only point in this passage, baptism, no, it's important. It matters to us. But I think that the, the main point of the passage, when you read it together, is discipleship. It's making disciples. And I wonder if we were to ask ourselves, honestly, is that the focus of my life? Is making disciples the focus of my life? Is it, is it even in the peripheral vision of your life, of my life? Would you say, you don't have to answer out loud, you don't even have to whisper to your neighbor, but would you be able to say that you have an eternal view of this life focused on the things that really matter in eternity, or do you tend to be focused on the temporary things that the world has to offer, like we talked about this week? Is the focus, how about this, is the focus of your Christian life yourself? Exactly. Think about it like this. Is the focus of your Christian life yourself, where you're, you kind of walk through your Christian life saying, well, you know, I looked over my life this past week, I didn't swear too much, and I didn't kick any cats, and I read my Bible a few times. Like, I, I prayed like four or five times this week. You know, I'm really growing in my faith. It's good. It's good to grow in your faith. I'm glad you're growing in your faith. But when we read this passage, it's pretty clear that growing in our faith is not just about you. It's not just about your own personal growth. This seems to put the focus on others, on, on uh, this, this mission that Jesus has commanded us to join Him in, in making disciples of others. Is that your focus in your everyday lives? You know, it's just like... When my kids play sports, it's not that I don't have an awareness of other things that are happening. I do. 
But most of my attention is placed on them because they matter to me most. If you and I are not making disciples, if that's not the focus of our lives, if there's something else that is the central focus of our lives, then we can't say that we're following Jesus. No, I don't, I don't like that. Pastor, I come to I come to church every week, and I sit in this pew, and and I and I give when the offering plate comes along. And I sing those songs. I listen to your sermon. I'm following Jesus. If my wife and I invited you over to our home to have a steak dinner, that would be nice, right? Steak dinner. We invite you to come to our home for a steak dinner, and we sat down at our table together. And, uh, and as we sat down, we were sitting, we were sitting, we were having a good time. And, uh, and on the table, there's corn in the cob, and there's baked potatoes, and there's you know salad with your favorite dressing. I don't know what it is, but we found it. We found your favorite dressing. It's there on the table, and you can smell the apple pie that my wife made for dessert. But no steak. There's a steak. You promised me a steak dinner. You can't say that we had a steak. Would it be satisfying? Would it be yummy? I'm telling you, my wife is a really good cook. That meal would be yummy, and you would be satisfied, but it wouldn't be a steak then without the steak. Right? That makes sense. If we are not making disciples, we're not following Jesus because His command to us is to make disciples. And yet, I, I wonder why it is sometimes that we are so satisfied as Christians to just enjoy this steakless steak dinner of a Christian life. Like, the, like that's okay, like that's acceptable, like that's normal. Why are so many of us focused on something other than the mission that Jesus gave us through us? <laughs> wonder sometimes why it is that my heart and maybe your heart thinks that it's acceptable or okay to go through the Christian life saying, yeah, I don't believe in God. I believe in God. I just don't, I just don't want to share my faith. I just don't want to do it. Go back to verse 18. I think this might be, for, for some of us, this might be the reason why. Verse 18, Jesus comes and tells his disciples this. He says, I I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. What do you really believe about Jesus? What do you really, what do you really believe about Jesus? Well, rescuer of my soul from sin and hell. Yep, check. That. Jesus died on the cross for my sins. He rose from the dead. Yep, believe that. Check that. You believe this? Jesus said. I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. That means authority over you. That means authority over me. Do you really believe that? I think sometimes what happens is we say, yeah, I, I, I really believe that Jesus is my Lord, that He's, he's my Savior. This whole thing about authority, I don't know. I'm struggling with that one. When the topic comes up in sermons, when this topic of sharing our faith comes up in grace groups, it comes up in conversations. Here's what I typically hear. And you probably have it. I believe in God. I just don't share my faith because I, I'm afraid. I get, I get fearful of rejection. I'm, uh, I'm fearful that I won't have all the right answers. I'm fearful that I'm going to get into this debate about theology and I'm going to look foolish. I don't think we have a fear problem. I think we have a, I don't really believe in the authority of Jesus Christ. Whenever we're struggling to share our faith, when we're not being obedient and making disciples, I don't think it's a fear problem. It's an I don't really believe in the authority of Jesus problem. Because if I did, if I really believe that he has authority over heaven and earth in my life, I'm going to do what he told me to do, whether it's comfortable or not. It's why it's, it's why it's not just a banner 
on our wall. It's not, we didn't put a banner up that says, as a church, we want to help people feel good about themselves. We put a banner up there to remind us that as a church, we want to help people meet Jesus, learn how to follow Jesus, learn how to share Jesus, so that we can all learn how to live a Jesus-centered life. That's the mission that Jesus gave us. I don't know if you've ever taken time to think about why. Why is this such a big deal? Right? Jesus is getting ready to go back to heaven. He's going to leave the disciples. And this is what he tells them right before we leave. This is the last command, which obviously has great weight and importance, right? So why, why does this matter so much to Jesus? Why does this mission matter so much? Write this down in your notes. It's a simple answer. You ready? Because hell is real, and the soul lives on. Because hell is real, and our souls live on forever. That's what it's There's lots of different passages that talk about and describe hell throughout the Bible. I'll just read two verses to you from Revelation chapter 14. Revelation 14 and verses 10 and 11 describes hell as a place where people are tormented with fire and burning sulfur. And this torment, this smoke, their torment, it rises, verse 11, it rises forever and ever. There is no relief, not in the daytime, not at night. It never ends. I hear people talk about hell like it's a joke. Well, I go at time, right? I go to a baseball game, have a beer here, because there's not going to be beer in heaven. All will enjoy that. That's not hell. It's not a joke. How is a very real place of torment and suffering where we're separated from God for all of eternity, separated from everyone, completely alone, and there is no relief ever coming. And so when we ask ourselves these questions, do you really believe that Jesus rescued your soul from hell? Do you really believe that? Yes, of course. And how much hatred must we have for those around us that we're not even willing to try to talk to them about the rescue plan that Jesus has, has offered us? Right? How much, how cold-hearted, how apathetic have we become if we're not even willing to try to talk to people about our faith? Knowing that hell is real, and that the soul lives forever. I know there's a lot of things happening on the field of your life. There's a lot of things happening on the field of your life. And a lot of it's really important stuff. A lot of it's interesting. You know, it's exciting. It's sometimes frustrating. It's okay, well, life is complicated. There's a lot of moving parts in there. But as a follower of Jesus, there needs to be this focus on making disciples. And it's not because, oh yeah, the preacher is hanging out, <coughs> tickets to the guilt trip. That's not why. That's not what should be motivating our hearts to be sharing our faith. It's because Jesus has all authority and He said to do it. I want to be obedient to that mission. That's the why. For those of you in the room who are not trained pastors, for those of you in the room who are not trained theologians, you don't teach it a For those of you who are not traveling evangelists, or maybe you don't feel like you have a gift of evangelism. For those of you in the room who quite honestly would never win a debate with someone who doesn't believe in God and likes to argue about it, like you know, you know, that's what they like to do. You would never win a debate with this. I want to encourage you this morning with three really wonderful examples of unlikely things. And I want to show you, hopefully, uh, before you leave today, uh, I want you to be able to take what we're going to look at here, to be able to look at yourself, maybe as an unlikely evangelist, and see the things that you can and should be doing. Because this mission matters to Jesus, it should matter to us. And you can do it. You can all do it. Here we go. Write this down. We're going to first take a look at some things that 
He's unlikely evangelists do. Here's the first one. Unlikely evangelists invite others to meet Jesus. Write it down. Unlikely evangelists invite others to meet Jesus. In John chapter 4, Jesus met this woman who was, uh, who was at this well. She was getting water. And uh, as the story records, she had been married five times, divorced five times. She was, she was living with a man at that time that was not even her. So uh, I think we would, we would probably agree that in that moment, uh, we probably wouldn't have her on our list of people that we're looking at as being effective missionaries, right? Probably not someone we would identify as an effective missionary. Jesus engages her in conversation. He talks to her about living water. He talks to her about who the Messiah will. He identifies himself as the Messiah, and, and he has this conversation with her about the gospel. I want to jump in in verse 28. Look at how she responds here in, in verse 28. The, the woman left her water jar beside the well. She ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? Look what happened. So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Look at the result of this interaction that Jesus has with this woman with the gospel. And then she just simply, she comes and tells her friends, hey, you need to come to Jesus. You need to come to Jesus. Verse 39, many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village, so he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Here is a woman that probably wouldn't win a, a debate in theology. Right? She didn't have a script. Right? You've seen maybe some of these evangelism uh, trainings where you can kind of memorize the script of things to say. She didn't have a pocket full of uh, gospel tracks to work with. She probably wouldn't be able to defend her faith against skeptics. She just she just invited her friends to come and meet Jesus. And we can do that. We can all do that. We can all invite our friends, our family, our neighbors, our coworkers. You can go to school with. You can invite them to meet Jesus. You can invite them into places where they'll get to hear and experience the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right? The, a church service is obviously an example of that. The grace group that you attend is an example of that. Christian concert, and a lot of these Christian concerts, they do a good job of presenting the gospel. There are lots of different uh, opportunities. There's Christian movies. Uh, more and more of them are coming out. Very well done. Like used to be in the past, they were super lame if they had any at all. They're really cheesy, and you're kind of embarrassed, right, to invite people to go into the distance. Not anymore. Not anymore. These are really high quality movies that are being produced. Talk about the gospel, right? These are opportunities for us to invite people to Jesus. Unlikely evangelists invite others to Jesus. Here's the second thing, right? Second thing, write this down. Unlikely evangelists share their story of how they met Jesus. Unlikely evangelists share their story of how they met Jesus. In John chapter 9, there was a man who was born blind his whole life, right? He's an adult at this point in the story. His whole life has known nothing but blindness. He meets Jesus. Jesus heals him. His whole life changes, right? And it sets off this huge controversy in town where the religious leaders are trying to discredit Jesus, saying, oh no, this is like some voodoo magic thing, right? He's doing this by the power of Satan. He's not from God. And other people are looking at this and saying, that doesn't even make sense. He's clearly from God. He wouldn't be able to do this if he wasn't from God. Right? So there's this debate, there's this controversy that's happening over what happened with this man. And we come to chapter 9, verse 25, and he's being questioned about this. What happened? Is Jesus from God? Is he from Satan? You tell us. Verse 25. The man says, I don't know whether he is a sinner, but I know this. 
I was blind, and now I can see. I don't know about your debate, but I know this. I met Jesus, and He changed my life. That's what I know for sure. This man was not going to be able to win a theology debate with these guys who their entire adult lives have been studying things like theology. Like, he's not going to win a debate with this man. But they could not debate his experience with Jesus because he couldn't see, and now he could. Jesus did that. Jesus changed his life. And he knew that for sure because he experienced it. We can all do that. We can all share our story of, of when we met Jesus and how Jesus changed our lives. We can do that. You start that conversation by simply saying, let me, let me tell you my story. Let me tell you my story. They may accept it. They may reject it. But you can share your story of how you met Jesus and how He changed your life. And God can use your story, right? The, the only way that God can't use your story, you don't tell it. God can use your story to help bring others into a, a place where they have the opportunity to hear the gospel and trust Jesus as their forgiveness. Their I will caution you with this. A quick caution. It's this. If you can't tell another person, if you can't tell another person what you believe about Jesus and what He's done for you, if you, like, you can't tell that story, and I would caution you to really think through what do you really believe? Do you, do you really understand the gospel? Do you really believe the gospel? If you're not able to share that with someone else, it's like this. Uh, we, can, we can claim to be anything that we want. But if we can't explain it, it's probably a good chance to harm that. I'm not endorsing the show Seinfeld. Uh, but there was a character on, on that show, his name was George, and he was unemployed, lived with his parents, he was a loser. And when he would meet people, he had, he had this tendency, he, uh, he was embarrassed about his life, and so he wanted people to be impressed with him, so he would make up these careers that he didn't have. And he would tell people, I'm an architect. No, I'm a, uh, he's a loser that lives with his parents at the age of 50 or whatever it was. But he tells people, I'm an architect, and, and then he would tell another person, I'm an importer, exporter, whatever that is, right? And he would tell people these things, and every time he did this, people would press him, they would ask him questions, and it would become evident very quickly, you're not an architect, you're not an importer, exporter, you can't explain what you do. If we can't explain what we believe about the gospel, if we can't explain this experience that Jesus uh, has changed our lives, and we can't verbalize that, we need to slow down for a moment and just think, what do I really believe? Do I really understand this? Unlikely evangelists share their story. How do Jesus? Here's the third one. Write it down. Unlikely evangelists are prepared to be bold about their faith in Jesus. Unlikely Evangelists are prepared to be bold about their faith in Jesus. First Peter chapter three verse fifteen. First Peter three fifteen. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your hope, our hope in Jesus, as a believer, always be ready. To explain it, always be prepared to give an answer, an explanation for your hope in Christ. The guy who wrote that, Peter, was certainly bold in his personality. You read through the Gospels, you'll we'll figure that out very quickly. He was very outgoing, very outspoken, very bold in his personality. He was the kind of guy that would act in anything, right? And some of you are like that. Some of, some of you, that's your personality. You do, and then you think. Or you offer advice, even though no one asked you for your advice. You offer it anyway. You offer your opinion because right, you think people need to hear your opinion. Because you like your opinion. And no one should hear it in any way. So some of you have that bold, outgoing personality. 
And obviously, God can use people to have bone and heart and personalities. It means people, right? But not all of us are like that. And not everybody in the room is bone and outgoing in their personality. It doesn't mean that we are off the hook from, from sharing our faith. We can't just let it to the bold and to the outgoing to share their faith. We're not completing the mission of Jesus if we don't share our faith. So here's what I would say. To those of us in the room, maybe who, who wouldn't see ourselves as bold or outgoing in our personalities, I would say this. That doesn't mean we cannot intentionally prepare to have really great conversations about our faith. We need to intentionally prepare for those conversations. And here's how we can do it. Real simple. Three things. Number one, we can pray every single day. Pray for the people that you know in your life, in the path of your life, that need to meet Jesus. Pray for their hearts. Pray that they would have a soft heart towards the gospel. You pray for them every single day by name. And you pray for your own courage. You pray for the, the opportunities that God would provide that those paths would meet. And that when the opportunity comes that you have courage and you have boldness, that you have the right words to say, pray every day about it. You can do that. You can all do that. The second thing that we can do is study the Bible. Right. Here's what typically happens. We, we typically wait until a question comes from someone and we're like, oh no, I don't know the answer to that. You feel stumped or embarrassed and you're like, no, 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 no. And so you avoid those conversations because it makes you feel uncomfortable. So don't wait. Don't wait until the awkward, con the awkward question that you don't have an answer for. Study. Prepare yourself. Right? Study the Word of God on a regular, daily basis. There's tons of resources. That exist. You can get them on your phone, a new version app. We talk about that all the time. There's tons of resources, really good quality ones, that you can study and learn. You know, Christian books. I, I don't know how many of you uh, are in the habit of reading through Christian books, like really good, solid Christian authors. Um, that's something you need to be doing. In this series, we've been at like two months now, or something like that, I've mentioned at least four really good books. I've put a, links. To, uh, on our website in, in the notes page. Go to the bottom, there's a, you hit the button and take it to Amazon. You, you can order it on your Amazon. Most of you probably have one. Right? I don't know how many of you have done that. I don't know how many of you have, have, have taken the initiative to say, oh, that sounds like a good book. I need to read that. So I am prepared to share my faith with others. But we should be doing that. We should be preparing our minds and our hearts for those conversations. Prayer and study. Here's the third thing. When we talk about uh, grace groups, I think typically what happens is we kind of have this focus that grace group is just about my own personal spiritual growth. Certainly that's part of it. But grace groups are an opportunity for us to talk about our faith. Like in an environment like this, I'm, I'm talking, we're listening, we're not really conversing about the matters of faith that we're discussing right now. But in a small group, you have the opportunity to talk about your faith with other people who also believe what you believe for the most part, right? And so you can practice talking about and verbalizing what you believe about the gospel and what you, what you believe about the Word of God. You know, in, in sports, we don't wait until the day of the game to show up. I guess we'll just figure it out. We'll wing it as we go. We'll figure it out as we go. We don't do that, right? We, we figure out what are some things that we know about the other team, and we talk about that. We practice the plays, like a, the same play, 100 times we rep, through repetition, so that when the moment comes, when it's time to play the game, we can do it without hesitation, because we've done it 100 times. Grace groups are not just about you and your own personal spiritual growth. They're about learning how to make disciples. They're about others. Unlikely evangelists are prepared. They're prepared to be bold about their faith in Jesus. Now maybe, maybe you would consider yourself an unlikely evangelist, and I would say to you, you are in really good company. When you, when you read through Scripture, there's tons of examples of people that would say, well, that was an unlikely candidate for what, what God chose to do that person. Tons. In fact, it, it would seem to me as an observation that God 
tends to prefer to use unlikely people to do amazing things. We just have to decide, am I going to make the focus of my life making disciples, or is it going to be something else? No. I'll say this. If, uh, if the focus of your life, I don't know your heart, right? You do. If the focus of your life right now is something sinful, then that you need to repent of that, make that right, and, and refocus your heart and mind back to Jesus. If it's something sinful, that's a, that's a common sense solution. That needs to change. But there are a lot of things that we put priority and focus on in life. Right? There's a lot of moving parts in the field of our lives. And, and a lot of them are really good things. And it's not that we have no, that we shouldn't have an awareness, that we shouldn't have you know, any sense of, uh, of connection to those other things that are happening on the field. But where's the focus? What really matters to your heart? Sometimes there are good things like, how about work, school, right? Work, school, these are good things. Is, is work, is school the focus of your life? Or is making disciples while you're at work, while you're in school, is that the focus? Is sports the focus of your life? Or is making disciples while you're enjoying sports? How about this? Is spending quality time with your family, it's a good thing, right? We all know this good thing. Is, is spending quality time with your family the focus of your life? Or is making disciples the focus of your life while you're spending time with your family? It's very different. How about attending church? I think we most of us agree attending church, attending race groups is a good thing. Is that the focus of your life? And I think if, if someone said, yeah, the focus of my life is, is, is church and grace groups, and, and we, a lot of people would applaud, that's amazing. You're a, you're a growing, mature Christian. You share your faith. What if, what, if, uh, what if making disciples was the focus of your life while you're participating in church activities, while you're participating in grace groups? while you're maturing in your faith, you're making disciples. It's not just about you, it's about the people that God has placed in you. A lot of great things happen in your life. Following Jesus. If you are a follower of Jesus, you need to have a focus on these things. So, do you really believe? You don't have to answer that Honestly, do you really believe that Jesus died on the cross as a payment for your sins and rose from the dead, proved his victory over sin and death? Do you really believe that Jesus is enough to rescue your soul from hell and change your life? Do you really believe that? And if your answer is yes, you say good, don't make that a problem. You need to share it. It's hell is real. Souls. Do you really believe that Jesus is God? Do you really believe that Jesus has authority over heaven, over earth, over your life, over my life? You say yes. Great. <laughs> Follow him and share in his mission to make us. Over the next two weeks, we're going to talk about how we do it. Specifically, how do we share our faith? How do we share the gospel with what we're describing as the unsaved Christian? Those who say, I believe in God. I live like He doesn't exist, but I believe in God. So I'm, I, think I'm, I think I'm good. I think I'm right with God. I'm pretty sure the default destination is heaven for most of us anyway. How do we share the gospel with people that think they're right with God and they're not? Good people, moral people, die and go to hell every day. If we really believe that hell is real, the soul lasts forever, if we really believe that Jesus has the authority over your life and my life, and this is his mission for us, to make disciples, if we really believe that, then we need to talk about how we do it. Be better. We're going to talk about that the next two weeks. I really hope and pray that you commit yourself to being here both weeks as we walk through just some practical ways that we can share with us. The people that God has placed in Father, thanks so much.